I mean, look at all the social pathologies. Look at the tobacco industry. Look at big pharma. Look at the oil industry. Look at the food industry. Look at the arms industry. Look at the extreme inequality that exists today. It's all of that is selection by consequences, cultural selection by consequences. There's no bad guys here. If you put any population of people in those circumstances, they will be selected by consequences like so many pigeons in a Skinner box. And so the solution is to change the reinforcement, broadly speaking, so that people and cultures are selected for the right things as opposed to the uh, uh, wrong things. And if you don't do that, then I promise you, cultural evolution will still take place, but it'll take you where you don't wanna, where you don't wanna go. Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Welcome back to Better Thinking. I'm Nesh Nikolic, and today's guest, which I'm extremely excited to announce, is Professor David Sloan Wilson. He's an evolutionary biologist and president of the Evolution Institute. Not only is he incredibly well-versed in an incredible career in evolution and, and, and biology, but also in the applications within psychology. Uh, so we cover topics in this interview that relate to clinical psychology from an evolutionary perspective, what B.F. Skinner got wrong in, in some of his work, uh, how human attempts to solve problems, you know, from an evolution perspective can have unintended consequences, uh, how there are mismatches in uh, our history in evolution and our present uh, environment and fascinating, really fascinating examples that uh, David provides, uh, living pro-socially, and finally, his new book, this view of life, which uh, I think is an incredible piece of work and you know, hopefully something that everyone will, will uh, get their hands on. With no further ado, I give you uh, the incredible David Sloan Wilson. David, a big thank you to uh, coming on the show. It's, this has been an interview that I've been really uh, looking forward to and excited to, to, to have you on. Being an evolutionary biologist and president of the Evolution Institute, um, and I know your, your, your work in psychology has been broad as well. So big thank you for coming on. Thanks to you. Now, look, uh, be, uh, before we get stuck into the many topics that we've just spoken about uh, a moment ago, maybe I can uh, hand it straight over to you to do a little bit of an intro of yourself, um, you know, how, how you've become an uh, evolutionary biologist and, and done all your work. I know there's many, many uh, writings and articles and, and, and uh, being president of the Evolution Institute. Maybe I just hand it over to you rather than me making a mess of it. Sure. Well, um, you know, when I tell my story, first thing I say is that my dad was a fam famous novelist, uh, Sloan Wilson, who had The Man in the Great Flannel Suit and uh, Summer Place. Some old timers in your audience might remember, uh, remember those books. And I became a scientist in part to escape from my dad's shadow. Uh, but I don't think I ever lost the novelist's uh, penchant for trying to understand the human uh, a condition. I love nature and I had an opportunity to indulge in my boyhood uh, in wonderful, wonderful nature. So when I became a scientist, I became an ecologist, somebody who could study nature uh, uh, scientifically. And at first I just, I, from serendipity reasons, I, I became an aquatic ecologist and I studied zooplankton and I was fulfilling that, uh, that proverb that, um, um, uh, experts know more and more about less and less until, until they know everything about nothing. And, um, <laughs> but I became, a, I became a scientist at the time that evolutionary theory was really becoming a unifying framework for understanding all of biology. You know, there's that famous phrase uttered by the geneticist Theodosius Dobzhansky, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And, um, and he uttered that um, that phrase. That was actually the title of, a, of an article in 1973, which was the year that I published my first scientific publication. So I was a graduate student then. Uh, it was in 1975 that Ed Wilson, the other Wilson, E.L. Wilson, uh, wrote Sociobiology, 
uh, it was in that decade that um, Nico Tinbergen and, and uh, um, Conrad Lorenz and Carl von Frisch won the Nobel Prize for their work on pioneering the study of animal behavior, uh, ethology. And so the idea that evolution can explain everything, <laughs> everything can be explained from an evolutionary perspective is in the first place what uh, set Darwin's theory apart from the very beginning uh, and was now fulfilling itself over a century later, uh, but only within the biological sciences. When it came to the human related sciences, then uh, those had been declared off limits. And since we do have a, a bit of time to spend to each other, let me just note that uh, Darwin himself thought that his theory applied to our species along with the rest of life. And he wrote extensively about human uh, humans in uh, origin and in the descent of man, the expression of emotions. Uh, so uh, everything about humanity was was uh, within limits for Darwin, morality, everything. So nevertheless, um, as especially when genetics was discovered in the or rediscovered in the early 20th century, the study of evolution became constricted to the study of genetic evolution. And the idea that cultural change is an evolutionary process, the idea of personal change as an evolutionary process, which is a theme within psychology, represented strongly by B.F. Skinner, who's a figure that we, we should be talking um, a lot about. All of these were basically seeded to their disciplines. And the study of evolution didn't go back to basics and broaden out basically beyond genetic evolution until the closing decades of the uh, 20th century. It was when you asked when, the, when did the term evolutionary psychology begin to be used, it was in the 1980s. And so most of what we'll be talking about as far as modern evolutionary theory in relation to human affairs will be based on things that for the most part took place in the last 20 or 30 years and are still only in the process of, uh, of, of spreading. So the idea that nothing about humans makes sense except in the light of evolution, nothing about culture, nothing about policy, nothing about policy makes sense except in the light of evolution it would be dumbfounding to the entire policy universe, okay? And so that's why, that's true. That's why I say, you know, I mean, my, the subtitle of my most recent book, This View of Life, that's Darwin's phrase, completing the Darwinian revolution. The Darwinian revolution is not yet complete and won't be until it makes sense of everything associated with the words human, culture, and policy. And I've been lucky throughout my career to be basically at the forefront of that with many others. Is that what's, what, what's meant in between that, uh, the distinction between evolutionary theory, which uh, most often looked at what is, you know, from a biological sense to, to now that evolutionary worldview of, you know, how we act, why we act. Uh, is, is, can you maybe talk about that a little bit to, to, to help us understand? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and it's a distinction I make again and again in my, my book, This View of Life, the difference between evolutionary science, really, not just theory. First of all, let's, what's the distinction between theory and science? Well, science includes theory plus experimentation and a dialectic between theorizing and then testing. So, so I think evolutionary science is a preferable term to evolutionary uh, theory. Sure. Um, but science only tells you what is. It does not tell you what to do. Uh, in order to know what to do, you have to combine knowledge with uh, values. Science plus values tells you what to do. If I say, you know, torturing babies causes pain, you need causing pain to innocent people is bad. There's your value in order to have the prescription. It's, it's wrong, bad, evil to torture uh, babies. Uh, 
And so a worldview is value laden, whereas science is other than the values that that uh, are required to be a science. And there's a whole interesting piece to say to say there in order to be a scientist, in other words, in order to have, be a person and for there to be a culture that is built and designed to apprehend factual knowledge, then all kinds of norms and protections and sanctions and punishments and and uh, values are required for the enterprise of science. So science is itself a moral system. Uh, nevertheless, the point of science is to generate factual knowledge. And then in order to know what to do with that factual knowledge, you need a worldview. Uh, and our taxonomy for this, our vocabulary for this is very uh, fresh and unsettled. So worldview is a, is a phrase, a meaning system is another phrase, and symbotype is a new phrase that I coined, I didn't, well, I guess I did coin it with, uh, with Steve Hayes, who will be known to your uh, audience, Tony Biglin, someone else that might be known to your audience, and Dennis uh, Embry, which really emphasizes something important. We're kind of, uh, this is a spontaneous conversation, so when important elements come into it will be, uh, will be spontaneous. Uh, but uh, the idea of symbolic thought, which of course psychologists and clinical psychologists and psychologists uh, have thought about a lot, that's their province. But the idea that it is an inheritance system, that it's something that evolved by genetic evolution and then became an evolutionary process in its own right. That in, that, and just as we, every one of us has a collection of genes, which we call our genotype, which determines in part who we are, we call that our phenotype, each and every one of us is also a collection of symbols. Let's call it our symbotype, which is also responsible in part for who we are. So that comparison between our symbolic systems and our genetic systems and two streams of inheritance, one much faster than the other, but both being winnowed to result in basically actions that are well, sit, well suited, adapted to their environments. So there's a whole context for therapy there um, in the sense that when therapists work with their clients, they're taking people for the most part, who are not well adapted to their current environments, that's why they're distressed, and they're trying to make them better adapted. So really, therapists are working with their clients to manage their evolution. And, and notice how easily I slipped into that language, but, uh, and you might call it just metaphorical, a different way of describing the familiar, but no, there's a lot of added value for being explicit about what does it mean to manage evolution? What does it mean to think about personal change and cultural change as truly an evolutionary process? So we're not using the word evolution in the vernacular now. We're actually using it now in the same more precise way that genetic evolutionists uh, uh, use it. What's the added value of that? And of course, you know, I have to convince the audience of, of that, but uh, there's a tremendous added value in being explicit about all forms of cultural and personal change as, as uh, an evolutionary process. Selection by consequences, as B.F. Skinner called it. Well, I was going to actually just talk about that for, for a moment. It's very easy to see in B.F. Skinner's work, you know, put a, put a pigeon in a box, get it to hit a, hit a, you know, a light or a button, a pellet comes out, it eats it. Um, that's reinforced. And if, if the uh, uh, pigeon is sufficiently hungry, it will repeat that over and over until satiation occurs and hence why we go into more operant conditioning type of scenarios. Uh, interesting, even in that small space, it's very adaptive. Uh, or if we look at evolution for a, um, uh, for a pigeon to repeat that. However, when the context change, which is the level of hunger, uh, we, we, we see a different pattern of behavior immediately emerge. 
And so it's, it, it's kind of fascinating to, 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 to look at the complexity, even in, in, in a little box is, is quite high, uh, let alone working with clients that are in a much more complex um, uh, environment and, and context than if, if we use that, that word symbotype. Right. Well, I mean, there's so much to say about Skinner, what he got right and what he did not get uh, uh, right. What he got right was summarized in his 1981 science paper titled Selection by Consequences, where he made a very simple comparison. He said there's something that operant conditioning, cultural change, and genetic evolution share in common. Uh, they're all variation, selection, and retention processes. Uh, variation exists, they, they differ in their consequences. And then the, the, the ones that have the best consequences, behaviors that have the best consequences is somehow increase in frequency. In the case of genetic evolution, that's the familiar process of genetic evolution. In the case of operant conditioning, it's the familiar process of operant conditioning, although we need to add a lot about symbolic thought. We'll get to We'll get to that. But basically, it's a psychological process that in the first place was uh, built by genetic evolution and itself is an evolutionary process. So if you want to know how a rat behaves or a pigeon behaves in a Skinner box, the most important information you need is the history of what took place in the Skinner box. You don't need to know about its genes or its uh, anything but the history of what took place in the Skinner box, the history of reinforcement. And yes, it is context sensitive. And that's because evolution did a, a sophisticated job of endowing us with our learning abilities. And so thanks to evolution, what, what you need to learn in one context might not apply to another context. It would be highly maladaptive to learn something in one context and behave the same way in other contexts. And so learning is context uh, specific. But, but Nevertheless, in each and every context, what organisms capable of learning do is they end up behaving in ways that are adaptive for that uh, uh, context, thanks to reinforcers, which, uh, which are the instincts, basically, that uh, uh, evolved by genetic evolution. And a similar story could be told for cultural uh, uh, change. And so, so that's the main thing that Skinner got uh, right, and maybe we could just pause there and uh, and continue at some point right away if you like. But, but and as to please as do. to what Skinner got wrong, certainly please See? do, please do. <laughs> okay, well I think there's two things that Skinner got wrong, and not just Skinner, but in in one case the entire field of of um, of psychology. And that brings us back to another person that I've already mentioned, Nico Tinbergen, who uh, shared the Nobel Prize for his pioneering work on uh, animal uh, uh, behavior. And Tinbergen is celebrated for making a point that applies to all products of evolution, not just behaviors, uh, which is that all products of evolution need to be understood from not one but four different perspectives. There's a functional perspective. And why does this trait exist compared to many other traits that could have existed? Then there's a historical perspective because evolution is a historical uh, a process. The trait that exists now are always at a certain time and, and evolved compared to other traits that existed then. So the history question is different than the function uh, uh, questions. Uh, marsupials and placental mammals both give birth. So functionally, they have, they're capable of giving birth. Um, but uh, how they do it, the placental and the, and the marsupials are very different because they evolved on different uh, uh, continents. Then there's a mechanistic question. All, all traits, including behaviors, have a mechanistic basis, a physical mechanistic basis. And they develop during the lifetime of the organism. So there's a development question. So function, history, mechanism, development. And an evolutionary approach is a fully rounded uh, study of traits from those four uh, perspectives. That's a major theme of my book, This View of 
this view of life. So against that background, if we go back to Skinner, what we find is, is that Skinner, his selection by consequences is basically the function question and probably the function plus the history question. Back to, you know, what, what do you need to uh, explain the, uh, the uh, behavior of the pigeon in the, in the Skinner box? Uh, well, you need the history of Brian uh, uh, Forsman. And I know that there's a literature where if you, if you uh, um, uh, put a, a different pigeons in, in their own Skinner boxes and then you select for the same behavior, often you get specific different ways that they uh, figure out how to press the bar or something like that. If there's, if there's more than a way to get the reward, then um, a, a pigeon will happen upon one way, uh, uh, one particular way, and so there's your history. If you had a puzzle box that could be opened in two different ways and you had put a bunch of pigeons in, some would do it one way, some would do it another way. That's exactly what happens when you have convergent like evolution because the mutations that evolved are chance, um, chance events. And then mechanism, of course, is, the, is uh, what Skinner disparagingly called mentalizing, basically. At some point, you have to open the, the black box of the mind and study the actual mechanisms that take place where all of this, this uh, learning ability takes place. And, and then of course that develops during the lifetime of the, of the organism. And so I'm speaking very fast here and I, I understand that you have a pretty literate audience so maybe it's okay to, to do that. But if you look at, for example, why did behaviorism become the dominant uh, um, rule of thought in, in psychology for a period of time? In part because you can ask the function question without knowing much about mechanism. And at the time, there was no, not, no way to know much about the mechanisms of the, of the, of the mind. And so the, the fact that you can be fairly predictive on the basis of, of uh, environmental inputs and, and behavioral outputs made behaviorism, you know, the most rigorous, uh, you know, didn't have to rely on introspection and, so on and so forth. But then when the so-called cognitive revolution took place, then that was seen as a replacement. It was just like behaviorism was somehow, something was deeply flawed about it and the solution was the cognitive revolution. Now there was a big mistake because what, sh what should have happened was to see that those approaches were, were complementary, that the cognitive revolution was adding in the mechanism question on top of the function question, not replacing it for heaven's sakes. And then the evolutionary psychology came in and was a critique of, of, uh, of the cognitive revolution, uh, but, it's, but also um, uh, rejected the, the behaviorist tradition and everything else open-ended about human behavior as part of what they call the standard social science model, and maybe I'm getting too geeky for everyone out there that's listening uh, to this, but what you're getting, and I guess what I want to, what I want to emphasize is um, uh, the complicated, torturous, circuitous history of psychological thought, which continues. There's nothing unified about the field of, of, uh, of uh, uh, psychology. It's not at all been unified. And it's kind of ironic that, that evolutionary psychology ended up being actually a narrow school of thought within psychology, whereas in fact, evolutionary psychology needs to be the unifying framework for all of uh, psychology. Now I'm just gonna finish up. Uh, I feel like I'm rattling on a bit too, too much, but the other thing that Skinner got wrong was that he was kind of overreaching in uh, what he thought that uh, operant conditioning could explain, for example, language. And I think that one of the great advances in uh, contextual behavioral uh, science was to appreciate that actually, no, the ability, the, the capacity for symbolic thought is something which has its own rules and is distinctively human. And that, uh, and that uh, uh, symbolic thought as an evolutionary system is different than operative conditioning. It's not by a history of reinforcement that, um, that evolution um, occurs when it's symbolic 
evolution, not entirely anyhow. And that's why cognitive therapy was needed to supplement behavior therapy and then mindfulness-based therapy supplementing cognitive therapy and recognition that there's something about our capacity for symbolic thought that requires its own its own techniques. You just can't do, you know, extinction exercises and things like like that. Those are helpful, but you need to go beyond them. And I'm really I'm treading into your field here now as a as an outsider, but hopefully I didn't make make too much of a fool of myself. No, no, it's 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 very, very interesting because speaking with uh Stefan Hoffman, I, I know one of your colleagues and looking at you know, uh, evolutionary science and how it, it, in some sense, can be an umbrella across all therapy styles and, and really looking at how evolution uh, plays in you know, clinical practice of you know, this idea of variation, uh, selection and retention, looking at therapists you know, trying to assist their clients in having greater variation, variation of thought, variation of behavior, um, you know, variation of experience, perspective, and the like, uh, then you know, moving across to improving their selection. You know, what, what do I select next that's more adaptive? And, and now that I've had the experience or I've you know, been, been willing enough to open my, my mind, my, uh, uh, my repertoire, now I can start selecting more often. And if I select uh, wisely, I might get more of the benefit depending on the context, my morals, ethics, and so on. Uh, and then obviously the, the, the final one is that practice side, which is retention. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. if, I can, if, if I practice it long enough, you know, we, we might actually call that uh, to, to have adapted um, rather than being you know, adapting, uh, have, have maybe adapted to a new um, space to continue evolution, continue evolving. Um, yep. But it, it, it makes so much sense, you know, whether, we, whether we're discussing, uh, you know, a human being uh, without, it, without therapy or, you know, within the context of therapy, we're still, tr- we're still all looking at the same, same processes, you know, whether it be ACT, CBT, um, you know, schema therapy, <clears throat> you name it. Um, it, it almost doesn't actually make, make uh, any um, uh, difference on this overarching model uh, of you know evolutionary science in clinical psychology you know that, that, that those three mechanisms that uh, i believe are now being researched more and, and, and considered yep totally so i'd love to hear it coming from you and uh, and i think that um, a lot of the basic insights from uh being explicit about an evolutionary perspective are elementary insights. So, you know, I could make some, here's an elementary statement about genetic evolution, which I'll then move over to cultural and personal evolution. Uh, One thing you need to know about genetic evolution is that it doesn't make everything nice. Very frequently it results in behaviors that are good for me, but not you, us, but not them, or especially short term, not long term helpful today, but at the expense of, of, um, of tomorrow. So in order to get, um, now evolution can result in outcomes that are adaptive in the normative sense of the word, good for all of us over the long term, let us say, uh, but only when special conditions are met, only when special conditions are, are uh, uh, met. And so if we want to uh, steer evolution so that, it, so that we achieve our normative goals, we must align evolutionary forces with our, uh, our goals, our normative goals. Otherwise, I promise you, evolution will become the problem, not the solution. And my, my colleague, Tony Biglin, who I think is probably known to some of your uh, audience, has, is publishing great stuff and on, my, uh, on the Evolution Institute's online magazine, This View of Life, on uh, basically social pathologies. I mean, look at all the social pathologies. Look at the tobacco industry. Look at big pharma. Look at the oil industry. Look at the food industry. Look at the arms industry. Look at the extreme inequality that exists today. It's all of that is selection by consequences, cultural selection by consequences. There's no bad guys here. If you put any population of people in those circumstances, they will be selected by consequences like so many pigeons in a Skinner box. 
And so the solution is to change the reinforcement, broadly speaking, so that people and cultures are selected for the right things as opposed to the uh, uh, wrong things. And if you don't do that, then I promise you, cultural evolution will still take place, but it'll take you where you don't want to, where you don't want to go. Now, I could repeat all of that at the personal level. Once you absorb the fact that evolution doesn't make everything nice, at the personal level, that means that individuals end up doing things which are adaptive in the evolutionary sense of the word, but not in a way that takes them in the direction of their normative normative goals. They might get their way in a relationship, for uh, example. Uh, they might avoid aversive events, uh, but then in a way that just kind of traps them in some larger uh, sense. And so to realize that the problems that an individual is attempting to solve with the help of a, a therapist are basically nothing organically wrong with the person. It's not as if they have any loose screws or anything. Their operating equipment is normal, but, but as evolutionary systems, their uh, uh, outcome of evolution took them to a place which was the problem, not the solution, just like those social problems that I talked about it. And then, and then therapy consists of that alignment that we were talking about, um, that we were talking about before. So that is, that's, um, that's pretty profound, actually. And it also reveals, uh, we could, we could identify three very different types of dysfunction that we need to distinguish. The first one I just described, which is uh, um, behaviors that are adaptive in the evolutionary sense of the word, but uh, but uh, uh, create problems from, um, from, from in terms of the valued goals of the person. Uh, the other is called evolutionary mismatch, in which uh, basically uh, adaptations to one environment, if the environment changes, then all bets are off. All bets are off. A good biological example is uh, aquatic insects uh, nowadays often are attracted to man-made reflective surfaces such as solar panels or glass buildings to their death. So that's maladaptive in every sense of the word. Why do they do it? It's because their, uh, their attraction to reflective surfaces evolved before human structures existed, in which case that was a reliable cue for water. I mean, it's very straightforward. Uh, so when the environment changes, all bets are off and people or any creature behaves maladaptively in every sense of the word. So there's another class of of uh, a dysfunction. And a third class of dysfunction is actually, you do have some loose screws, that, that basically that your, that your um, um, mind and body for any reason has been injured, damaged, and is basically like, a, like any machine that's been damaged is not, is, not, uh, is not working well. In which case, a whole different set of tools is you know, maybe gene therapy, maybe, maybe you're unlucky enough to have a, you know, a double dose of a deleterious gene or something, uh, uh, something like that, in which case uh, you would call for um, uh, uh, gene therapy. There's some of my colleagues have claimed that uh, if you look at the uh, spectrum of disorders, uh, and it's a bell-shaped curve, uh, in the middle range, those are people kind of acting normally uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, but if you but if you look at the three to five percent of really severely mentally disabled people, uh, then that could be the result of uh, um, a mutation selection balance uh, in highly multigenic traits. There can be just like you know a concentration of deleterious uh, deleterious uh, 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 traits. So basically, you've been dealt a really bad hand of uh, of genes, and so that makes it a struggle for you. And then how to deal with that problem is different than if you're just a regular person who, who had some you know, harsh events and now you're depressed or something like that, that uh, then uh, would call for a very different kind of, uh, of treatment. David, I'm interested to hear about your thoughts in terms of, obviously we are uh, 
organisms that are that have problems and we're trying you know we're attempting to solve them uh, you know using lots of different different means and whether it's selection by consequence that function whether it's mentalizing you know whether it's the, the history we have obviously we've gone through incredibly rapid change uh in in you know, the last uh, certainly 50 years, you know, technologically, the way that the world looks. Um, maybe people won't say that even of, of prior times as well. Maybe we're just repeating the uh, same sort of conversations, but 50 years later um, or 100 years later. But w- what do you see has been some of the, uh, at least from your perspective, changes in our context as a, as a uh, you know, human race that... Uh, is shifting the way that we uh, are behaving. You know, for, for example, use the insect uh, example of uh, they're, they're, they're seeking you know, reflective services because they, they, they've, they've adapted to understanding that that's going to give them highest uh, um, chance of finding water. Unfortunately, now they're, they're, they're moving towards solar panels to, to their death. Uh, is there any um, known things that human beings are, are doing in a, in a similar way that is quite contextual where you say, you know, all bets are off. What we've learned historically, the way that we're designed, we're now just gravitating so much towards, you know, a particular type of behavior or, or, or action or, you know, pathway. Right. Well, that is a um, big, big question. <laughs> it is. And, um, <laughs> Well, uh, these mismatches that I described with the aquatic insect example just uh, lay all around us uh, uh, in, in, our, in our case. But it's complicated by the fact that uh, all evolutionary processes generate uh, mismatches. So when I generalized evolution beyond genetic evolution, I also generalized uh, mismatch. And uh, these fast evolutionary processes, cultural evolution, symbolic evolution, operant conditioning. So these are rapid processes of, of, uh, of adaptation. In some ways they solve mismatches. So, you know, when the human, when Homo sapiens spread north, they didn't have to evolve fur. They, they could have culturally evolved clothing. We have all kinds of examples, uh, examples uh, like that. So, so, so these fast paced, Evolutionary processes are, are solutions to genetic mismatches in many respects, but then, oddly enough, they create mismatches of their own because cultural evolution is not instantaneous, is it? And so if Syrian refugees end up relocating in Norway, I'll, you can bet that there's going to be a mismatch in terms of those uh, cultures, and it will not be an easy one to, it will not be easy to solve. If you're in a working class family and you're the first member of your family to attend college. That's a uh, mismatch. Yeah. So yeah. we have mismatches at all, at all scales. That makes sense. And, and, and what, what we have an advantage of as being homo sapiens is that we, we might use the word, you know, innovate faster. Uh, we, we, we might bring you know, technologies forward like, uh, clothing that maybe insects don't have uh, uh, capacity to do so very quickly. Um, having said that, it, this is why it might um, harm the masses and, and kill people quite quite uh, sorry kill kill those insects in in a particular region quite significantly until uh, enough individuals recognize uh, the, the, the shift and are able to uh, have offspring and, and, and continue on so that, that there, there's a little bit more um, selection between uh, shiny surfaces and, and in, in many ways that's that, that's what we're doing hopefully at a more rapid rate and um, what, what you discussed about you know whether it's uh, things like you know uh, arms or Big farmer or other 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 uh, you know challenges that that the human race experiences in some sense that they they might represent uh, solar panels. Yeah, yeah, and um, there's there's some unambiguous examples in humans uh, that, uh, and then there's a lot that are that are complicated enough so that it takes uh, just a lot of science is required to uh, 
to sort out what's what's true. So, for example, uh, you live in Australia, right? Yes. And uh, where do your ancestors come from? Mine are from Serbia, so former Yugoslavia. Okay. Okay. Well, I, you are maladapted to the sunny climate of Australia, I'll bet. You really have to worry about skin cancer and stuff like stuff like that. So there's a mismatch. When people from Europe uh, relocate to a place like uh, Australia, their entire skin tanning pigmentation system is different. Uh, it was well adapted to Europe, not to Australia. That's a no-brainer. I mean, you know, things like that is total no-brainer. When, when an African goes up north, then they got a problem with vitamin D. Uh, uh, Synthesis. There's many, many examples uh, like that, and including diseases, for heaven's sakes. I mean, you know, when you're adapted to the diseases of your particular geographical location, and then you travel to another location, you're more susceptible, and the diseases that you bring with you are deadlier to, to uh, the people that you're um, encountering. The whole colonization of the New World was something which was really accomplished by diseases more than, more than um, anything. Uh, anything else as Jared Diamond documents in uh, guns, germs and, and steel. Why is it that so many people have to wear eyeglasses? Why is there an epidemic of myopia? Uh, but uh, uh, much more in some places than in, uh, in others. It turns out that eye development involves an extensive interaction between the developing eye and brain and the environment uh, during development. This is Tim Bergen's development uh, question. And there's something about modern environments that's different enough from the ancestral environments so that eye development goes wrong. And it's only recently that we've kind of pinpointed what that uh, probably is. It could be more than one thing, but it's probably time spent indoors because ambient light levels indoors is lower than outdoors. And there's uh, one study in particular that I'm thinking of compared uh, Chinese, ethnic Chinese, living in uh, Singapore and Australia. And they were both ethnically Chinese. They both, you know, did a lot of reading in school and, and stuff like that. But there was a huge in uh, difference in the incidence of, uh, of uh, myopia. And the big difference between the two populations was that the Chinese kids in Australia spent a lot of time more outdoors. So, uh, did you know that 100% of modern people have malformed jaws? And if you look at- if 100%. You look at 100%. If you look at, at uh, skulls of, hunter, of current day hunter gatherers or any uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, archeological sample, you find that the upper teeth and the lower teeth, they meet, they meet. They may, oh, and a, not one in front of the a, other. Not one in front of the other. But because we don't chew hard things, then that is interferes with jaw uh, development. So there's a whole bucket of these, of these things, which are thankfully uh, not hard to establish. But then if we get to something like the paleo diet uh, and the idea of dietary mismatch that any species any species if it evolved on a certain diet and then if you feed it a novel uh, diet then you can get that mismatch and it doesn't have to be poisonous per se you could do an experiment has been done with drosophila with fruit flies in which you just raise them on different media one might be you know molasses and banana and the other might be orange and whatever and you raise them for generations on their respective media, then switch media, and uh, and you get a, a decrease in in fitness. I mean, there's no such thing as poison, really. It's it it's all depends on what you're adapted to uh, eat. Poisonous mushrooms aren't poisonous to other many other species. We can't eat berries that birds can eat, so on and so forth, and so. Uh, the idea that the diseases of civilization, and, and you've heard that phrase probably, these are diseases that are more prevalent in so-called developed countries than in so-called less developed 
uh, countries, those are kind of like sure signs of mismatches because in developed countries, then, then uh, those are the ones, you know, the built environment and, and all sorts of activities are most different from just what people have always, people have always uh, uh, done. So the whole category of diseases of civilization is in a, in a large sense, an indication of, of, uh, of mismatches. And yet at the same time, exactly what the best diet is, you know, should it be an all meat diet? Should it be a this diet? Should it be a that diet? Is quite difficult to unravel. It's probably very uh, contextual based on your own ancestry and extremely susceptible to fads, extremely susceptible to fads. And so the whole paleo diet movement is just in part because people are making money off it and they're marketing it and they're hawking it and, 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 and so on, is it's uh, quite discouraging because um, there's a real, I mean, what could be more important than figuring out dietary mismatches, but the way it happens, the way it goes is just results in abundant junk science, junk food and junk science. So, so um, that's a bit discouraging. How do we go about uh, solutions in, in that type of space? Is this where we wait for the process of evolution? I don't even know how long that takes. Are we, are we you know, do, uh, someone who starts, let's say, for example, if, if we continue using the, the, the example of a paleo diet, uh, if, if everyone were, were to get onto a paleo diet, does it take several generations or does it take, you know, many thousands of years. How does evolution actually, you know, what, what, what are the time frames that we look at before, uh, I, I suppose it's healthy for us? Uh, I don't even know if, if, if that's a proper question. I'm not sure how to, how to formulate that. Oh, well, it's a very important, it's like the question in, in many respects from any kind of uh, normative policy perspective. Uh, we need to be... Uh, Causing positive cultural evolution to to uh, to uh, uh, happen, and the point I want to make there is that when it comes to human personal and cultural evolution, there is both a intentional component to it that needs to be appreciated, and an unintended component that mm. also needs to be appreciate it. We need to hold these things lightly, as we say in the CBS uh, um, <laughs> literature. And the whole idea that, uh, that, that evolution can be intentional and unconscious goes counter to um, the study of genetic evolution, and it was called the modern synthesis. Part of the modern synthesis, which defined the study of evolution in the middle part of the 20th century, involved in a very very dogmatically stating that evolution has no purpose. Mutations are random with respect to what is selected. Only the environment does the selected. The idea that evolution can be any kind of conscious or intentional or purposeful uh, um, uh, process was just like sinful to, to even think it. <laughs> and I'm using, no, I mean, that kind of thing happens in science, taboo in science. You know, any scientist knows that taboos exist in science. We've been, and the way you're taught is just like, no, this is just like, this was rejected. Because you don't ever think this is what people are taught. And like any other taboo, they just obey that uh, dictum. I know better than anyone because group selection was such an idea that was rejected. Lamarckism was, was, uh, was uh, rejected as just... Uh, and then it turned out that those ideas had some merit after, uh, um, after all. So in order to legitimize the idea of conscious uh, and intentional evolution, evolution having a conscious and intentional uh, component requires work, actually quite a lot of work. And um, uh, that's a little bit strange because way back in the early 20th century, um, uh, uh, Mark Allen, Alec Baldwin and a couple others uh, had a very important idea that became known as the Baldwin effect, which is basically the idea that even given what we just said about evolution, genetic evolution having no 
purpose, mutations are random with respect to what's selected. Um, when organisms learn things, if it's a learning organism, then they end up doing certain things, learning to do certain things that are adapted for them in their lifetimes. But that then alters the selection pressures. And so basically learning behavioral evolution has an impact on genetic evolution. There's a feedback process. And that can actually be kind of Lamarckian in a way that's also perfectly good Darwinian. So this idea that behavior, in modern terms, I'd put it that, that behavior is a, fa uh, that learning is a fast paced evolutionary process that leads to the process of evolution and genetic evolution follows. A famous and standard example is, uh, you know, first humans learned to, to domesticate livestock and then that made milk available to adults for the first time in mammalian history. Adults could drink milk and they were not genetically adapted uh, uh, for that. But then now that that resource was available, then genetic evolution took place. And now we have only in populations that, that uh, keep livestock, the genetic ability to digest lactose as, as adults. So there's behavioral and cultural evolution leading uh, the slow process of, uh, of genetic uh, evolution. But in, in, in modern terms, if you think about, about um, behavioral individual change and cultural change as evolutionary processes, well, of course they have an intentional component. Of course, individuals are striving to do something. Of course, cultures are striving to do something, but they don't know exactly what to do. And so therefore, it has to be some experimental prep. They have to do this and that, and then they have to select this over that. So, so basically, the intentionality of an evolutionary process is, is the selection part. It's what's, it's what's being selected. So, and so a lot of that goes on in both individuals and, and, uh, and cultures. We have to get comfortable with, uh, with that, even though it's obvious in, uh, uh, in retrospect. But then, but then what we think we're selecting for, what we think we want, has all kinds of unintended consequences that we did not intend. And intentions collide with each other. And so what I'm striving for and what you're striving for, they collide with each other and they produce outcomes that nobody intended, but that becomes the field of variation. And so that leads to the fact that actually there's a huge unintended component to cultural evolution and personal evolution after, after all. And so what that means is, is that when cultural evolution takes place, often it results in things that work without anyone having designed them and nobody knows how they work. So we're taking part in it in some kind of adaptive dance, but nobody invented it. We have to study it in the same way that we have to study our genetic adaptation. We don't know why we see, we just do it. And so the same goes for some of our cultural uh, uh, practices. We have no more insight introspecting than, than uh, and often it takes a very long time. I mean, uh, if you look at cultural evolution over the last 10,000 years, centuries can be required for some of these things. And, and none of that is adequate for what we need to do uh, uh, today. So today we need to, we need to uh, basically construct uh, a cultural inheritance system that works faster, more intentionally, at a larger scale uh, than ever before with the global good in mind. That's fundamental. That uh, I mean, what the theory tells you, if you didn't already think it, is that unless we actually uh, design our policies with the, with the global good in mind and then organize everything underneath that accordingly, then uh, evolution will surely take us where we don't want to go as it is right now. And really what you've described is, is that that's the holy grail of psychology, right? Where people are acting in a way they don't even know why they haven't stopped and paused, uh, you know, and been mindful, thoughtful, considered around why am I doing what I'm doing, you know, and, you know, could it be possible that uh, 
why I'm doing something hasn't been considered and there might be a different different approach or maybe what I've learnt or what I've understood or my feelings are, are not congruent with where I actually want to go. Um, and so the, it's the holy grail of, you know, questioning, for example, a core belief. Uh, and, you know, we have cultural beliefs, um, you know, beliefs in, in, in general and, and where, where, we're, where we're really kind of surprised by the world is when there are these what appear to be large shifts like um, electrification of cars. Uh, we're all kind of dumbfounded, but in actual fact, you know, it, to me, it looks more, more um, uh, 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 understandable in this conversation about, you know, it's not only the, the, the selection by consequence, that was the, the, the function that uh, I think everyone's tried to achieve by making it cost effective, but in order to be able to do that, you know, there had to be people who would invest, which is really more of, 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 of you know, that, uh, you know, historical or, or, or mechanism sort of change as well of people thinking more green uh, to, 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 to actually uh, often part with more money um, for something that they could uh, have much cheaper. And so it's a, it's a huge cultural, cultural shift. How do we begin, because I know you're very passionate about this space, how, how do we begin to, you know, talking about your work in the Evolution Institute, how do we begin to put that, that uh, intention uh, and understanding of evolutionary science, you know, to work in the real world setting as, as, as a collective? Because you're, you're saying we need to do this, you know, almost at a governmental level or an organizational level. I know having spoken with Paul Atkins, the, you know, uh, about pro-social uh, and, and, and your work with him as well. How do you, how do you see we, 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 we do this as, as humans? Well, again, a big question that could be answered a number of ways. Uh, I think the way I'd like to begin answering that question is by returning to the concept of worldviews. Um, and to quote Einstein, who said, the theory decides what can be observed. So, uh, I mean, there's so much out there in the real world, we cannot possibly attend to it all. We need to have that worldview we've been talking about in order to organize our perception. It's only thanks to our meaning systems that we see what we do and other things become invisible and then we process them in different ways. So the first thing that needs to take place is actually to adopt the right theory, that theory being uh, this view of, uh, of life. And, and um, that's especially important based on the alternative narratives that are out there, the competing narratives. For example, in the economic world, the competing narrative is homo economicus, rational choice theory, neoclassical uh, economics, greed is good, uh, um, a whole, other world view that, um, that motivates, makes certain things make sense, such as the invisible hand, the idea that we could all just go about trying to make profits for ourselves and, and uh, satisfying our individual desires. And then somehow that's gonna, we're gonna be led as if by an invisible hand to benefit the common, the common good. If that's the theory in your head, then you'll go ahead and do that. And, um, but the consequences won't be what you thought, not, not nearly. And even beyond that, this gives me an opportunity to uh, identify individualism as a competing worldview. And Homo economicus is just one species of individualism. Individualism is the idea that all things social can be understood and should be, must be understood in terms of individual thought and action. So the individual individual becomes the fundamental unit of analysis and treatment. And clinical psychology is suffused with individualism. I mean, most people who call themselves clinical psychologists, they, what do they work with? Individuals. Maybe they work with couples, maybe families, but I know this literature. And do they ever work with groups in the context of that group's everyday lives? Not if they call themselves a clinical psychologist. No. Maybe if they call themselves an organizational psychologist and so on. And then we get to silos within the 
you know within the within the uh, uh, discipline. So so uh, and one of the things that evolutionary theory tells us so powerfully it's it is it is the alternative to individualism, and that's huge when you think about individualism as the dominant cultural tradition of the last seventy years. If you go if you go back earlier than that, then we find that. Uh, all kinds of people thought of society as something that was holistic that could not be reduced to individual psychology or even biology. We get Durkheim and folks like folks like that talked about social facts that could not be reduced. The idea of society as an organism um, was a commonplace idea back then. So individualism was really a, a kind of a sea change that uh, that replaced uh, an older tradition that was more holistic. And what we have on offer today is, is actually a return to that earlier holism. You could call it neo-Durkheimian, uh, but in a way which is much, much better justified by, uh, by, uh, by theory. I mean, the reason that, that Durkheim and the, the tradition of functionalism was uh, replaced was because it was so axiomatic, as if every, all aspects of society had to have a uh, function and no theory about how it got that way or any, any of that. But what we have today is one of the things we can say is that in our ancestral past, this is another good example of, of, uh, of mismatch. And uh, a person who, who, who uh, studies this beautifully is Jim Cohen at the University of Virginia uh, and his wonderful research on uh, holding hands, which maybe we can describe, it's probably not familiar to your full uh, audience. But the, the bottom line is, is that in our entire history as a species, and even if you go back to, to our primate uh, ancestors, individuals were never alone. There's almost no solitary primate species. Individuals always exist in the context of social groups. And in the case of humans, distinctively in the case of humans, those were nurture and cooperative human groups. And so individuals always existed in a cooperative milieu and our brains and bodies evolved against that background. What Jim's work shows is that basically the brain and body almost do not distinguish between personal resources and social resources and making their many trade-off decisions. And so if you remove an individual and you cause them to be isolated, which so often happens in everyday life. That is quite a lot like removing an ant from its colony. If you remove an ant from its colony, then it's gonna behave in crazy ways. And probably it's just gonna just do nothing but try to refind its colony. The only good thing you can do to that ant is to put it back in its colony. And so if you have an individual that's distressed and so often distressed for lack of social resources. Clinical psychologists know that in their own way, but their entire profession is stacked against them because all they have access to is that individual, typically for only brief periods of time, when what's required is a social intervention and to be able to work with the other people that, that are important in the lives of the uh, client. And so clinical psychology needs to go beyond working with individuals. And if that requires going beyond their disciplinary silos, and so be it. And one, and one uh, of the great advantages of pro-social, which Paul Atkins, my great colleague and great and respected colleague, Paul um, Atkins and I are formulating with many others now is that that's what we do. We work with functionally oriented groups. We work with groups of people that are trying to do something together. A neighborhood, a business, a church, a school, a family, groups of people that are trying to do something together. We work with the whole group in the context of what they're trying to do together. That's the functionally organized unit. And then we go up in scale and we work with those groups interacting with other 
group, the multi-group scale. So we're doing it right. And of course, we're using the tools of clinical psychology. We're using, you know, the ACT matrix, mindfulness-based. And mindfulness-based practices work super well at the group level. If you get a group to reflect upon their values and, and uh, you know, how they should behave on those values, things that get in the way, how those manifest as counterproductive behaviors. And, and then when a group decides to move towards its valued goals, they have all the social reinforcers that take place within a group in order to help the individual to to do it because that's the natural that's the natural uh, unit and so I hope that I can convey a sense of how uh, in the first place the adopting the new world view is important because it makes something like the uh, the wrongness of individualism obvious. It's only when you it's only when you basically adopt an evolutionary worldview that you can make such a statement that in our entire history of a species we never existed on on our own. We always existed in the context of a small and highly highly cooperative group. What was opaque and visible from the standpoint of individualism becomes obvious from the standpoint of of evolutionary theory and then things follow from from that after your common sense is reoriented then then i mean of course we should <laughs> do this thing that we haven't done at all yet so <laughs> it's such a such an elegant way to look at it uh, in terms of taking one little ant away from its colony how how hopeless helpless and and you know, in, in many ways useless it becomes it it um you know, will certainly die um, but the anguish that will occur before it dies will be immense uh, because it, it, it's lost it's everything uh, but yeah. just putting that yeah. back yeah. in its colony is 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 is, is the world you know, that's the context of its world yeah, and it was uh, so. It's a great metaphor. Let me let me channel Jim Cohen's work, if I might, because it might be familiar to some of your listeners, but I'm sure not, not all. He's a clinical neuroscientist, very much part of the CBS uh, uh, community, and uh, he was working with a elderly gentleman who was a World War II veteran experiencing uh, post traumatic stress disorder late in life and was just totally recalcitrant to any kind of therapy, would not do anything that Jim asked him to do. And at some point he said, I want my wife with me. And Jim had never heard this request before. So his wife came and at first Jim treated her as a bystander and the gentleman was no more receptive than before. And then his wife said, let me hold his hand. And so she held his hand and a transformation occurred. And this gentleman was now very receptive to therapy. And Jim was stunned. He knew that something had taken place in the brain of that old gent by holding hands. And he really wanted to know what that was. And so he embarked upon a research program which involved taking anyone and putting them in a fMRI machine and then stressing them with electric shocks, electrodes tracked to their ankles and doing it under three conditions alone holding the hands of a stranger and holding the hands of a loved one so now he could see what was going on in the brain when it was under stress and holding the hands of a loved one had this tremendous calming effect and so uh this was cueing him and then now Jim, when he writes about this, and I hope everyone will go, you know, beat a path to, to Jim Cohen and, and his papers just to learn um, uh, more about this, to what he calls social baseline theory, which is, just as I said, I actually described it a little bit earlier, is because uh, the natural human social environment is, has abundant social resources. The brain and body have evolved against that background. And so when the, when the brain and body make their trade-off decisions, 
they're factoring in social resources in addition to personal resources. When you deprive the social resources, then you put your state, you put your mind in, a, in a just a stress zone right then and there. And so as one of Jim's colleagues told him, uh, think of the holding hands condition as the normal condition, not the alone conditions. The holding hands condition is the normal, uh, is the normal psychological uh, state. That's when the mind is at, is at rest. And an experiment by that colleague uh, named uh, um, Dennis Prophet um, is, uh, uh, says it all. Uh, Prophet would take people to the base of a long hill and have them estimate the slope of the hill. So you do, and he had them do it under different conditions in which he would deplete their personal resources, such as having fasted or not, carrying a heavy backpack or not, uh, after a workout or not. And what he discovered was, was that uh, when you deplete someone's personal resources, of course they're less inclined to climb the hill, but they actually perceive that as a steeper hill. That's just the way we're constructed. And so then he added a fourth condition of being alone or having a friend standing next to you. And just having a friend standing next to you decreased the slope of the hill. So what was the brain doing in all of those cases? The brain was making trade-off decisions based on the availability of, of resources as to whether the prospects of climbing a hill of making an effort, basically. But the brain was also almost not distinguishing between its personal resources and its uh, social resources. And when you expand upon that, there's a small but very dynamic literature on this. You can almost every psychological process from perception, and we've already talked a little bit about uh, perception, all the way down to just about any Psychological, psychological process you might name is likely to be very different when taking place in the context of a cooperative group as opposed to alone, alone. And so just imagine almost every psychological experiment that's ever been done as like the alone condition and what any one of those results would look like if it took place in a supportive environment. I mean, it just shows you what a paradigm shift this is. That's absolutely mind boggling because it, it, it goes out and poses that <laughs> immense question of you know, uh, the findings in the science have to be understood within the alone condition. Uh, and so, uh, yes, they're valid, but only within that alone condition and it doesn't say anything about the uh, uh together collective uh you know secure condition or normal condition if we can call it as you did yeah yeah and there's a whole field of research and let me just put a call out for anyone that's in a position well actually uh among your audience there are practitioners and also there's probably uh, researchers and uh, what an opportunity this is to do both in real world settings. What we're in a position to do, because pro-social is designed to work in these functionally oriented groups and to make them more cooperative, uh, more nurturing, structuring them in a way that, uh, that basically is protective against disruptive behaviors, intentional and, and otherwise, then we're in a position to create this supportive uh, social environment and as, as practitioners and as scientists we're in position to study it we're in position to study it at any level that we so that we so choose and so this is a huge research opportunity this is where my background as an evolutionary biologist comes in handy and actually makes this very intuitive for me because if you're trained in evolutionary biology you know you cannot understand anything about a species. If you were to hand me a species of bird, for example, and tell me nothing about it, I can tell you nothing about that bird or very, very little. I need to know the environment that, in which that bird evolved. And so field studies are the starting point 
of evolutionary inquiry for all non-humans. You begin by studying the organism in the context, there's that context word, of its natural environment. That's what field science is. And if laboratory science isn't, isn't built upon field science, then it's very likely to ask all the wrong questions. Now that's not how human related research typically takes place, but it's how it should take place. And so what ProSocial is doing and other naturalistic research programs is basically adding the field component to psychological research. We should begin by studying people in their natural, at least their current environments as they go about their daily lives. And then we should work with that and of course we should do laboratory experiments, but those laboratory experiments should be informed by the field experiments. So ProSocial is, is um, basically restoring the correct balance of field research and, and the correct relationship between field research and laboratory uh, research. And so what an amazing opportunity this is for a collaboration between practitioners and basic science uh, researchers. We're trying to put that together as part of ProSocial and we invite both practitioners and scientists to join us in this, uh, in this endeavor. It makes so much sense and in so many ways, although clinical psychology, psychology in general tries to uh, assist and is only doing so on that individual sort of basis, it does, still heavily lean on taking a good uh, client history to understand the environment in which that, that human being uh, evolved, grew up in, adapted uh, in that really short period of time of evolution. But uh, uh, it's, it, it, it's fascinating of the, the similarities, uh, but also appreciating we're only speaking in it with, with an individual on an individualistic level rather than a collective um, and, and uh, trying to, you know, we, we often see so much how often people who are lonely are in the greatest distress. I think to, to me that that is just blindly clear, you know, ki kids who are being bullied, you know, uh, have, have the worst, worst, worst experiences in school. Um, you know, ki kids that are, you know, uh, shunned by their family, you know, do not feel secure there. And, you know, sometimes people might scratch their heads and ask, you know, how, how could someone you know, uh, be, be, be so awful and terrible to others? Um, and you only need to start uh, looking at one's history to, to figure out how adaptive those, those, those mechanisms of survival probably are, which might you know, mean harming others to get by, to find some level of security because, it, it, it's almost like, you know, the colony going out and attacking that one little little uh, ant. And you know, if if it's going to survive, it better it better learn to be ruthless. Well, this um, uh, Nesh, uh, provides a way to segue to what seems to be a very different topic of education, uh, but while staying well within the uh, the uh, paradigm of this view of life. Turns out that if you look at uh, good old hunter-gatherer societies and many other traditional societies, but the, the societies that most closely approximate are everyone's ancestral environment. Uh, what you find is actually very little bullying. And why is that? It's because imagine a small group, a village-sized group, there's not that many kids. Um, and so th what that means is that kids of different ages are interacting with each other. They're going around and mixed age groups and mixed age groups is a natural protection against bullying because if you're a 14 year old interacting with other 14 year olds well that can be competitive but you're if a 14 year old in a group with an 18 year old and an eight year old then that's not going to go down the same the same way and uh, what they've discovered is is that most learning is not conducted by adults but by older kids kids learn from older kids. The oldest kids want to be adults. It's the only game in town. And the younger kids want to be like the older kids. And it takes place mostly in the context of practice and play. And so 
that is the kind of the natural form that education takes that a tremendous amount is transmitted. The amount of information that, that needs to be transmitted and is transmitted is just stupendous. The entire toolkit of the culture of how to survive and, and uh, in, uh, in uh, often highly challenging uh, environments. So if you compare that uh, kind of upbringing with modern education and modern childhood in many ways, in and out of school, what you find is all kinds of disconnects, this age segregation, now your bullying comes in. Children being taught by adults, play being removed from the curriculum, and so on, and it's a train wreck. And so there's your mismatch. And, Massive. And what can be done once you see things the right way is just like, it's like, now that we need, and there's no lack of experiments, no lack of experimental schools and other, and other um, um, examples to learn from, no examples, no, no lack of experiments that you can, that can do to just to, to see, does this uh, ancestral form of, of education, might that work as well in modern life as it does in, uh, in uh, as it always, as it always has? And, you know, the answer to that question is not obvious. It might be that some modern forms of knowledge require modern forms of education. That could be true. Let's just do the work and see. And, and, and that, uh, the, the basic answer to that question is no, actually, the, this ancestral form of learning and, and teaching is, is still the best in modern life. And, and, uh, and my biggest proof of that is that it, um, it describes graduate education, the most advanced form of education. When you enter graduate school, you get a little, some formal instruction, but for the most part, you're picking the person, you're finding the person that knows a little bit more than you. It's a senior grad student, it's a postdoc, it's this professor, it's that, it's that professor. It's, it's an active form of learning. You're the one that needs to be uh, uh, directing it. It's like, so that's the most advanced form of, of modern education, and it is strikingly like, the hunter-gatherer model. It's mind-blowing just thinking about it as you're talking about it. it, it it's just ringing, you know, ringing a bell saying, well, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be lots of unintended, you know, uh, factors to, to, to consider as well. Uh, but you know, I, I can so easily see, you know, a younger student being bullied, for example, and an older student in, in the context that you're talking about would, would step in and say, listen, you know, that's not okay. Uh, and would quite quickly, you know, because they're a little bit more morally advanced, the, com the competition, uh, they're not competing with the younger kids. They intervene. You now have a younger person who's probably under the wing of an older um, kid who's, you know, they're going to look up to. And we all know, you know, the subjects that we looked up to our, our, our teachers with, we absorbed more information. We encoded it faster. We, we kind of thrived in that environment versus someone that we didn't get along with. And wow, what a rich, rich, rich environment. Uh, I might have to go to uh, my local uh, um, uh, primary school where my daughter's at and have a chat with the principal to, to, to bring this idea forward. Well, the, the person to read is, and uh, he's uh, easily found on the internet, his name is Peter Gray. There's actually more than one Peter Gray in this business, but Peter Gray is one of them. Um, and he has a book called Free to Learn. And if you just type Peter Gray into in YouTube, uh, he's a charismatic speaker and uh, you'll just be inspired. You'll just be uh, uh, inspired. Looks like I found my new guest, my next guest. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. No, he is, uh, he is uh, uh, truly um, uh, charismatic. And his own story, he was the first, he wrote the first intro psych text from an evolutionary perspective, Peter Gray's Psychology. He was a professor at Boston College, but he did rat work and stuff like that. But his son began to rebel in public school uh, at about the age of 10 years. He started doing everything that he was told not to do. And so, you know, meetings were held and it all culminated 
in this big meeting in which his, his little son was surrounded by adults, his parents, his teachers, the principal all telling him he had to behave. And the little boy looked defiantly up at them all and he said, go to hell, <laughs> go to hell. <laughs> and, uh, and so Peter broke down into tears and he said, I have to be on my son's side. And so he looked for alternative schooling and by great luck he found an alternative school in his uh, vicinity called the Sudbury Valley School, which had, for its own reasons, converged upon this type of education. It was a radical school. And his son thrived and actually became an instructor of the school. And Peter was so intrigued that he began to study it. And he, so he changed his own research focus. He studied the alumni. He said, what do the, what do the, what do the alumni of this School do. Well, you know, they did great. And, um, and so uh, this, became Peter's, this became Peter's uh, cause that he's been pursuing uh, ever since. So he's reviewed the anthropological literature and he has a blog on psychology today. Uh, so he's a champion of the homeschooling and even the unschooling uh, uh, movement. Uh, there's quite a few schools now that have adopted the Sudbury uh, model. Everyone should be thinking of it now in the pandemic age uh, as to what they might be doing to, uh, to uh, that's actually an opportunity to uh, create this kind of, of schooling. And so there's a whole piece there that uh, to, to follow up upon. David, I could uh, speak with you for hours, uh, forget <laughs> hours, days, weeks. Um, where, where can listeners you know, find out more about your work? I know that your, your latest book, This View of Life, uh, Completing the, the Darwinian Revolution, uh, is, is out. Where can people find out more about you, uh, you know, your works, your, 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 your colleagues? What books should they be reading? Well, if you have liner notes, you can put these down, but uh, there's the Evolution Institute, and you can Google these terms and you'll get right there. So the Evolution Institute, its magazine is called This View of Life. My uh, uh, website is called davidsloanwilson.world. You can also get there by darwinianrevolution.com. <laughs> And uh, there we have all manner of podcasts and so on. I did a podcast with your countryman, uh, Joe Walker, the uh, Jolly Swagman, uh, who's very literate about this, by the way. He's interviewed other people. I mean, he's definitely someone to, to uh, catch up on. You guys should get to, uh, uh, to know each other. But uh, if you think that this podcast went on uh, along, my podcast with him went on for three hours wow. and actually told... Uh, told the history of this of uh, of a group selection, which we actually didn't get to much by name, but but uh, uh, basically this whole everything we've been talking about at at still greater length, and I and I actually refer people to that podcast as perhaps the best way to learn about the complex history of ideas that we've also uh, that we've also uh, uh, touched upon. And then I will end by, by saying the, the newest thing is that uh, for a long, long time, I've actually been working on my first novel. And, um, and that novel is, is uh, actually a sequel to Atlas Shrugged, the iconic novel by Ayn Rand that provided the moral foundation for the greed is good individualism of uh, today. And so my novel is called Atlas Hugged. <laughs> <laughs> and is uh, and is a fictional uh, a rebuttal, a critique of the greed is good um, uh, worldview. So if you type in in just a few weeks, it'll be on sale online. So if you type Atlas Hugged, then uh, and if you're a fiction buff, then um, you can read about it in fictional form. Uh, and if you're a nonfiction buff, then uh, please begin with uh, with uh, this view of life. Uh, completing the Darwinian revolution. Is your novel uh, say something about your uh, father's work? Oh, in the pref in the prologue, it does. It, it does, and so uh, as you might imagine, personally, uh, actually end up be ending up being a novelist after all is a very intimate uh, uh, 
to me uh, personally. But also, this gets us back to evolution. I mean, we are storytelling animals. We do think and communicate in terms of narrative. And telling a story, and especially one that, that's a, a lengthy story, like an epic or a, um, um, one that provides a whole cosmology, a whole worldview, um, is something which is deeply native uh, to us, to create them and to, and to listen to them. And to create something like that, my first experience, it was nothing like nonfiction. Uh, writing. I mean, those characters became as real to me as real, as real people. And others can judge whether I did it well or poorly, but, but, uh, but it was uh, really one of the best experiences of my life to create a, a story, and a story, not just any story, not a story to entertain, but a story to convey meaning uh, at, such, uh, at such length. I'm glad I did it no matter how the book fares, and no matter how many people uh, uh, read it, but also it might be, uh, and of course it was Ayn Rand herself who said, uh, and this of course uh, I begin my book with the quote from Ayn Rand who said, uh, art is the indispensable medium for the communication of a moral ideal. Art is the indispensable medium for the communication of a moral ideal. We convey our morals through stories and that's why Atlas shrugged was by far her most effective vehicle. She wrote essays and did all that kind of stuff, but it was Atlas Shrugged that was the vehicle, her most successful uh, uh, vehicle. And so we'll see what happens with Atlas Hugged. <laughs> Dave, that's a beautiful place to, uh, I think, I think end it on. I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, letting me pick your brain and, and, and find out so much about this, you know, obviously very complex, but uh, interesting and informative way of, of how, you know, we, we can change our worldview and, and, and move towards that more you know, collective space and, 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 you know, that pro-social life as well. Uh, thank you very much, David. Thanks to you for, uh, for doing this. And I think that uh, this uh, um, blogging and podcasting and so on is really, you know, part of the communication that's, uh, uh, that's needed. So you're you're doing something very important with us, and uh, and so uh, I return my thanks. Thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen. There you have it, David Sloan Wilson. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review. Subscribe, share it via social media, and tell others about it. Start a conversation. It's listeners like you that make this able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources and just lastly if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team develop your experience and get into some exciting work come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out i'd love to hear from you